They came from test tubes. They came pale as ghosts with eyes as blue-white as glacier ice. They came first out of Korea. I try to picture David's face in my head, but I can't. They've told me this is temporary, kind of shock that happens sometimes and you've seen a person die that way. Although I try to picture David's face, it's only his pale eyes I can see. My sister squeezes my hand in the back of the limo. It's almost over, she says. Up the road against the long right iron railing, the protesters huddle against the cold wind. They grow excited as our procession approaches. There are many standing in the snow on both sides of the cemetery gates, men and women wearing hats and gloves and looks of righteous indignation, carrying signs I refuse to read. My sister squeezes my hand again. Before today, I had not seen her in almost four years. But today, she helped me pick out my black dress. She helped me with my stockings and my shoes. She helped me dress my son, who is not yet three and who doesn't like ties, who is now sleeping on the seat across from us without any understanding of what he's lost. Are you going to be okay? My sister asks. She's watching the protesters. No, I say. I don't think I am. The limo slows as it turns onto cemetery property and the mob rushes in shouting obscenities. Protesters, protesters push against the sides of the vehicle. You aren't wanted here, someone shouts, and then an old man's face is eyeing the glass, his eyes wild. God's will be done, he shrieks, for the wages of sin is death. The limo rocks under the press of the crowd. The driver accelerates until we are past them, moving up the slope towards the other cars. What's wrong with them, my sister whispers. What kind of people would do that on a day like today? You'd be surprised, I think. Maybe your neighbors, maybe mine. But I look out the window and say nothing. I've gotten used to saying nothing. She'd shown up at my house this morning a little after six. I'd opened the door and she stood there in the cold and neither of us spoke, neither of us sure what to say after so long. I heard about it on the news, she said finally. I came on the next plane. I'm so sorry, Mandy. There are things I wanted to say then, things that rose up inside of me like a bubble ready to burst, and I opened my mouth to scream at her. What came out belonged to a different person, came out a pathetic sob. She stepped forward and wrapped her arms around me, my sister again after all these years. The limo slows near the top of the hill and the procession tightens. Headstones crowd the roadway. I see the tent up ahead, green, its canvas sides billowing in and out with the wind like a giant's breathing. Two dozen gray folding chairs crouch in straight rows beneath it. The limo stops. Should we wake the boy? My sister asks. I don't know. Do you want me to carry him? Can you? She looks at the child. He's only three? No, I say. Not yet. He's big for his age. I mean, isn't he? I'm not around kids much. The doctors say he's big. My sister leans forward and touches his milky white cheek. He's beautiful, she says. I try not to hear the surprise in her voice. People are never aware of that tone when they use it, revealing what their expectations had been. I'm past being offended by what people reveal unconsciously. Now it's only intent that offends. He really is beautiful, she says again. He's his father's son, I say. Ahead of us, mourners climb through their, from their cars. The priest is walking toward the grave. It's time, my sister says. She opens the door and we step out into the cold. They came first out of Korea. That's wrong, of course. History has an order to its telling. Be more accurate to say it started in Britain. After all, it was Harding who published first. It was Harding who shook the world with his announcement. And it was Harding who the religious groups burned an effigy on their church lawns. Only later did the Koreans reveal they'd accomplished the same goal two years before. The proof was already out of diapers. It was only later, much later, that the world would recognize the scope of what they'd done. When the Yang Bay fell to the People's Party, the Korean labs were emptied and there were suddenly thousands of them. Little blonde and red-haired orphans, pale as ghosts, starving on the Korean streets as society crumbled around them. The ensuing wars and regime changes destroyed much of the supporting scientific data. But the children themselves, the ones who survived, were incontrovertible. There was no mistaking what they were. It was never fully revealed why the Yang Bay had developed the project in the first place. Perhaps they'd been after a better soldier. Perhaps they'd done it for the oldest reason, because they could. 
What is known for certain is that in 2001, disgraced stem cell biologist Wang Wusuk cloned the world's first dog, an Afghan. In 2006, he revealed that he tried and failed to clone a mammoth on three separate occasions. Western labs had talked about it, but the Koreans had actually tried. This would prove to be the pattern. In 2011, the Koreans finally succeeded, and a mammoth was born from an elephant surrogate. Other labs followed, other species, the pallid beach mouse, the perennial ibex, and older things, much older. The best scientists in the U.S. had to leave the country to do their work. U.S. laws against stem cell research didn't stop scientific advancement from occurring. It only stopped it from occurring in the United States. Instead, Britain, China, and India won patents for the procedures. Many cancers were cured, most forms of blindness, MS and Parkinson's. Rich Americans had to go overseas for procedures that had been commonplace in other parts of the industrialized world. When Congress eventually legalized the medical procedures, but not the lines of research which le led to them, the hypocrisy was too much. Even the most loyal American cyber researchers left the country. Harding was among the final wave, leaving the United States to set up a lab in the UK. In 2013, he was the first to bring back the thylacine. In the winter of 2015, someone brought him a partial skull from a museum exhibit. The skull was doliocephalic, long, low, large. The bone was heavy, cranial vault enormous. Part of a skull cap that had been found in 1857 on a, in a quarry in the Nandra Valley. Snow crunches under our feet as my sister and I move outside the limo. The wind is freezing. My legs grow numb in my thin slacks. It is fitting he is being buried on a day like today. David was never bothered by the cold. My sister gestures toward the limo's open door. Are you sure you want to bring the boy? I could stay with him in the car. He should be here, I say. He should see it. He won't understand. No, but later he might remember he was here, I say. Maybe that will matter. He's too young to remember. He remembers everything. I lean into the shadows and wake the boy. His eyes open like blue lights. Come, Sean, it's time to wake up. He rubs a pudgy fist in, into his eyes and says nothing. He's a quiet boy, my son. Out in the cold, I pull a hat down over his ears. He's still half asleep as we climb the hill. The boy walks between my sister and me, holding our hands. At the top, Dr. Michaels is there to greet us, along with other faculty from Stanford. They offer their condolences, and I work hard not to break down. Dr. Michaels looks like he hasn't slept. David was his best friend. I introduce my sister, and hands are shaken. You never mentioned you had a sister, he says. I only nod. Dr. Michaels looks down at the boy and tugs the child's hat. Do you want me to pick you up, he asks. Yeah. Sean's voice is small and scratchy from sleep. It's not an odd voice for a boy his age. It's a normal voice. Dr. Michael lifts him and the child's blue eyes close again. We stand in silence in the cold. Mourners gather around the grave. I still can't believe it, Dr. Michael says. He's swaying slightly, unconsciously rocking the boy. It's something only a man who's become a father would do, though his own children are grown. It's like I'm another kind of person now, I say. I mean, nobody's told me how to be her yet. My sister grabs my hand, and this time I do break down. The tears burn in the cold. The priest clears his throat. He's about to begin. In the distance, the sounds of protesters grows louder. They rise and follow their chants, not unpleasant. So from this distance, thankfully, cannot make out the hateful words. When the world first learned of the Korean ch children, it sprang into action. Humanitarian groups swooped into the war-torn area, monies exchanged hands, and many of the children were adopted out to other countries. They went to prosperous households in America and Britain and different countries all over the globe. They were broad, thick-limbed children, usually slightly shorter than average, Though there were startling exceptions to this. They looked like members of the same family. Some of them assuredly were more closely related than that. There were more children, after all, than there were fossil specimens from which they derived. Duplicates were inevitable. From what limited data remained of the Koreans' work, there had been more than 60 different DNA sources. Some even had names. Old Man La Chapelle au Saint, Sanidar and Vindia, there's the handsome and symmetrical La Pharisee specimen, even Ahmed One, huge Ahmed One, who stood, who stood 1.8 meters tall and had a cranial capacity of 
1,740 cc's, the largest Neanderthal ever found. Techniques perfected on dogs and mammoths had worked easily too within the genus Homo. Extraction, then PCR to amplify. After that came IVF with paid surrogates. Success rate, the success rate was high. The only complication, frequent cesarean births. And that was one of the things popular culture had to absorb, that Neanderthal heads were larger. Tests were done. Children were studied and tracked and evaluated. All lacked normal dominant expression of the MCIR locus. All were pale-skinned, freckled with red or blonde hair. All were blue-eyed. All were RH negative. I was six years old when I first saw a picture. It was the cover of Time, what is now a famous cover. I'd heard about these children, but had never seen one. These children who were almost my age from a place called Korea. These children who were sometimes called ghosts. The magazine showed a pale, red-haired Neanderthal boy standing with his adoptive parents, staring thoughtfully up at an outdated anthropology display at a museum. The wax Neanderthal man in the display carried a club. He had a nose from the tropics, dark hair, olive-brown skin, and dark brown eyes. Before Harding's child, the museum display designers had supposed they knew what primitive looked like, and they had supposed it was decidedly swarthy. Never mind the Neanderthals had spent ten times longer in light-starved Europe than a typical Swede's ancestors. The boy looked up at the display with a confused expression. When my father walked into the kitchen and saw the time cover, he shook his head in disgust. It's an abomination, he said. I studied the boy's jutting face. I'd never seen anyone with a face like that. Who is he? A dead end. Those kids are going to be a drain for the rest of their lives. It's not fair to them, really. That was the first of many pronouncements I'd hear about the children. Years passed, and the children grew like weeds. And as with all populations, the first generation exposed to a Western diet grew several inches taller than their ancestors. While they excelled at sports, their adopted families were told they could be slow learners, might be prone to aggression. Families were even told in the beginning that the children could be antisocial and might never fully grasp the nuances of complex language. They were primitive, after all a prediction which, which turned out to be as accurate as the museum displays. When I look up, the priest's hands are raised into the cold white sky. Blessed are you, O Lord, our Father. Praised be your name forever. He breathes smoke, reading from the Book of Tobit. It's a passage I've heard at both funerals and marriage ceremonies. And this, like the cold on this day, is fitting. Let the heavens and all your creations praise you forever. The mourners sway in the giant's breathing of the tent. I was born Catholic, but found little use for organized religion in my adulthood. Little use for it until now, which use is so clearly revealed. It's an unexpected comfort to be part of something larger than yourself. It's the comfort to have someone to bury your dead. Religion provides a man in black to speak words over your loved one's grave. It does this first. If it does not do this, it is not religion. You made Adam and you gave him your wife Eve to be his love and support. From these two, the human race descended. They said together, Amen. Amen. The day I learned I was pregnant, David stood at our window, huge, pale arms draped over my shoulders. He touched my stomach as we watched a storm coming in across the lake. I hope the baby looks like you, he said. I don't. No, it would be easier if the baby looks like you. He'll have an easier life. He? I think it's a boy. Is that what you'd wish for him, to have an easy life? Isn't that what every parent wishes for? No, I said. I touched my own stomach, put my small hand over his large one. I hope our son grows to be a good man. I'd met David at Stanford when he walked into class five minutes late. <clears throat> he had arms like legs, and legs like torsos. His torso was the trunk of an old 75-year-old oak grown in the sun. Full sleeve tattoos swarmed up one bulging ghost pale arm, disappearing under his shirt. He had an earring in one ear and a shaved head. A thick red goatee balanced the enormous bulk of his convex nose, gave some dimension to his receding chin. The eyes beneath his thick brows were large and intense, as blue as a husky's. It wasn't that he was handsome, because I couldn't decide if he was. It was that I couldn't take my eyes off him. I stared at him. All the girls stared at him. He sat near the aisle and didn't take notes like the rest of the students. As far as I could tell, he didn't even bring a pen. On the second day of class, he sat next to me. I couldn't think. 
I didn't hear a single word the professor said. I was so aware of the man sitting next to me, his big arms folded in front of him like crossed thighs. He took up a seat and a half, and his elbows kept brushing mine. It was me who spoke first, a whisper. You don't care if you fail? It wasn't a question. Why do you say that? He never looked at me and replied so quickly that I realized we'd already been in a kind of conversation sitting here without speaking a word. Because you aren't taking notes, I said. Ah, but I am. He tapped his temple with a thick index finger. He ended up beating me on the first two tests, but I beat him on the third. By the third test, I'd found a good way to distract him from studying. It was harder for them to get into graduate programs back then. There were quotas, and like Asians, they had to score better to get accepted. There was much debate over what name should go next to the race box on that entrance forms. The word Neanderthal had evolved into an epithet over the previous decade. It became just another N-word polite society didn't use. I'd been to the clone rights rallies. I'd heard the speakers. The French don't call themselves Cro-Magnums, do they? Loudspeakers boomed. And so the name by their box had changed every few years as the college entrance questionnaires strove to map the shifting topography of political correctness. Every few years, a new name for the group would arise, and a few years later sink again under the accumulated freight of prejudice heaped upon it. They were called Neanderthals at first, then Archaics, then Clones. Then, ridiculously, they were called simply Koreans, since that was the country in which all but one of them had been born. Sometime after the word Neanderthal became an epithet, there was a movement by some militants within the group to, to reclaim the name, to use it within the group as a sign of strength. But over time, the group gradually came to be known exclusively by a name that had been, that had been used occasionally from the very beginning, a name which captured the, the, hidden, the hidden heart of their truth. Among their own kind, and finally among the rest of the world, they came to be known simply as ghosts, the ghosts. All other names fell away. Here finally was a name that stayed. In 2033, the first ghost was drafted into the NFL. What modern weight training could do to Neanderthal's physiology was nothing short of astonishing. He stood 5'10 and weighed almost 360 pounds. He wore his red hair braided tight to his head. His blue-white eyes shone out from beneath a helmet that had been specially designed to fit his skull. He spoke three languages. By 2035, the year I met David, the front line of every team in the league had one. Had to have one to be competitive. They were the highest paid players in sports. As a group, they accumulated wealth at a rate far above average. They accumulated degrees and land and power. The men, beginning mostly during their youth and continuing after, accumulated women and subsequently children. And they accumulated finally the attentive glare of the racists, who found them a group no longer to be ignored. In the 2040 Olympics, ghosts took gold in wrestling, in powerlifting, almost every event in which they were entered. Some individuals took gold in multiple sports in multiple areas. There was an outcry from the other athletes who, who could not hope to compete. There were petitions to have ghosts banned from competition. It was suggested they should have their own Olympics, distinct from the original. Lawyers for the ghosts pointed out carefully, tactfully, that out of the fastest 400 times recorded for the 100-yard dash, 386 had been achieved by persons of at least partially sub-Saharan African descent and nobody was suggesting they get their own Olympics. Of course, racist groups like the KKK and the neo-Nazis actually liked the idea and advocated just that. Blacks, too, should compete against their own kind, get their own Olympics. After that, the whole matter degenerated into chaos. One night, I brought a picture home from work. I turned the light on over the bed, waking him. Smile, I told him. Why, David asked. Just do it. He smiled. I looked at the picture looked at him. It's you, I said. Still smiling, he snatched the picture from my hand. What is this? When he looked at the picture, his face changed. Where'd you get this? He snapped. It's a photocopy from one of the periodicals in the archive, one of the early studies of Ahmed. Why do you think it's me? This could be any of us. The bones, I said. He crinkled up the paper and threw it across the room. You can't see my bones. Teeth, I said, are bones I can see. That's not me, he rolled onto his side. I'm me. And then I realized something. I realized he'd already known he was Ahmed. And I realized, too, why he kept his head shaved, because there must have been another two or three of them out there, other athletes whose faces he recognized from the mirror, 
Shaving his head kept him distinct. In some complex way, I'd embarrassed him. I'm sorry, I said. I ran my hand across his bare shoulder, up his broad neck to his jaw. I leaned down and nibbled on his ear. I'm sorry, I whispered. But some things you learn you wish you could unlearn, like Diane, the new researcher from down the hall, leaning over my shoulder. I realize it may be politically incorrect, she said, then paused. Or perhaps I put the pause in there. Perhaps I heard what, what, what wasn't there because I'm so used to what came next in its almost endless variation. How I hated that term, politically incorrect. Hated the shield it gave racists who got to label themselves politically incorrect instead of admitting what they really were, even to themselves. I know it may be politically incorrect, she said, then paused. Sometimes I just wish those slow pads would stop stirring up trouble all the time. I mean, you'd think they'd be grateful. I said nothing. I wished I could unlearn this about her. I heard David's voice in my head. Peace at all costs. But David, I thought, you don't have to hear it. I leaned forward, looked both ways, confidential revelations. Inside talk from people who don't know, don't know you're outside, way outside. People look at you, David, have sense enough not to say something. And the new researcher continued. I know the coalition is upset about what Alderman Johnson said. He's entitled to his opinion. And people are entitled to respond to that opinion, I said. Sometimes I think people can be too sensitive. I used to think that too, I said. But it's a fallacy. It is? Yes, it's impossible to be too sensitive. What do you mean? Each person is exactly as sensitive as life experience has made them. It is impossible to be more so. When I was growing up, I helped my grandfather prune his apple trees in Indiana. The trick, he told me, was telling which branches helped grow the fruit and which branches didn't. Once you've studied a tree, you get a sense of what was important. Everything else you could cut away as useless baggage. You can divest yourself of your ethnic identity through a similar process of selective ablation. You look at your child's face. You don't wonder whose side you're on. You know that side. I read in a sociology book that when someone in the privileged majority marries a minority, they take on the social status of that minority group. It occurred to me how the universe is a series of concentric circles, concentric circles and you keep seeing the same shapes and processes wherever you look. Atoms are like solar systems, little solar systems, highways, a nation's arteries, streets, its capillaries, the social system of humans follows Mendelian genetics with dominant and recessives. Minority ethnicity is the, is the dominant gene when part of a heterozygous couple. There are many Neanderthal bones in the Field Museum. Their bones are different from ours. It's not just their big skulls or their short, powerful limbs. Virtually every bone in their body is thicker, stronger, heavier. Each vertebrae, each phalange, each small bone in the wrist is thicker than ours. I've wondered sometimes when looking at these bones why they need skeletons like that. All that metabolically expensive bone and muscle and brain had to be paid for. What kind of life makes you need bones like chunks of rebar? What kind of life makes you need a sternum half an inch thick? During the Pleistocene, glaciers had carved their way south across Europe, isolating animal populations behind a curtain of ice. Those populations either adapted to the harsh conditions or they died. Over time, the herd animals grew massive, becoming more thermally efficient, with short, thick limbs and heavy bodies. So it began the age of the Pleistocene megafauna. The predators, too, had to adapt. The saber-toothed cat, the cave bear, they changed to fit the cold, grew more powerful in order to bring down the larger prey. What was true for other animals was true for genus Homo, nature's experiment, the Neanderthal, the Ice Age's ultimate climax predator. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. The priest clears his throat. Brothers and sisters, strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. I shall show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in human and angelic tongues but have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. I watch the priest's face while he speaks, this man in black. And I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all the mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Dr. Michaels is still rocking my son in his arms. The boy is awake now. His blue eyes move to mine. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
Three days ago, the day David died, I woke to an empty bed. I found him naked at the window in our living room, looking out at the winter sky, his leonine face wrapped in shadow. From behind, I could see the V of his back against the gray light. I knew better than to disturb him. He became a silhouette against the sky, and in that instant, he was something more and less than human, like some broad human creature adapted for life in extreme gravity, a person built to survive stresses that would crush a normal man. He turned back toward the sky. There's a storm coming today, he said. The day David died, I woke to an empty bed. I wonder about that. I wonder if he suspected something. I wonder what got him out of bed early. I wonder at the storm he mentioned, the one he said was coming. If he'd known the risk, we never would have gone to the rally. I'm sure of that, because he was a cautious man. But I wonder if some hidden inner part of him didn't have its ear to the railroad tracks. I wonder if some part of him didn't feel the ground shaking, didn't hear the freight drain, train barreling down on us all. The day David died, I woke to an empty bed, thing I'll have to thing I'll have to grow used to. We ate breakfast that morning. We drove to the babysitters and dropped off our son. David kissed him on the cheek and tousled his hair. There was no last look, no sense this would be the final time. David kissed the boy, tousled his hair, and we were out the door. Mary waving goodbye. We drove to the hall in silence. David's mind was on the coming afternoon and the speech he had to give. We parked our car in the crowded lot, ignoring the collaterally already the, uh, ignoring the counter rally already forming across the street. We shook hands with other guests and found our way to the assigned table. It was supposed to be a small luncheon, but the alderman's inflammatory statements and his refusal to apologize had swelled the crowd. These things were usually civilized affairs with moneyed men in expensive suits. David was the second speaker. Upon the podium, David's expression changed. Before his speeches, there was this moment, this single second, when he glanced out over the crowd and his eyes grew sad. David closed his eyes, opened them, and spoke. He began slowly. He spoke of the flow of history and the symmetry of nature. He spoke of the arrogance of ignorance. In whisper tones, he spoke of fear. And out of fear, he said, grows hatred. Let his eyes wander over the crowd. They hate us because we're different, he said, voice rising for the first time. Always it works this way. Wherever you look in history, always we must work against it. We must never give in to violence. We are right to fear, my friends. We must be vigilant. We'll lose everything we've gained for our children and our children's children. He paused. The specific language of this speech was new to me, if not the theme. David rarely wrote his speeches ahead of time, preferring to pull the rhythms out of his head as he went, assembling an oratorical structure from nothing at all, building it from the ground up. He continued for another ten minutes before finally going into his clothes. They've talked about restricting us from athletic competition, he said, voice booming. They've eliminated us from receiving most scholarships. They've limited our attendance in law schools and medical schools and Ph.D. programs. These are the soft shackles they've put upon us. We cannot sit silently and let it happen. The crowd erupted into applause. David lifted his hands to silence them, and he walked back to his seat. Other speakers took the podium, none with David's eloquence, none with his power. When the last speaker sat, dinner was brought out, and we ate. An hour later, when the plates were clean, more hands were shaken, people started filing out to their cars. The evening was over. David and I took our time, talking with old friends. We eventually worked our way into the lobby. Ahead of us, out in the parking lot, there was a commotion. The counter rally had grown. Somebody mentioned vandalized cars, and then Tom was leaning into David's ear, whispering as we passed through the front doors and out into the open air. It started with thrown eggs. Thomas turned, egg white drooling down his broad chest. The fury in his eyes was enough to frighten me. David rushed forward and grabbed his arm. There was a look of surprise on some of the faces in the crowd, because even they hadn't expected anybody to throw things. I could see, too. The group of young men clumped together near the side of the building, eggs in hand, mouths open. It was like time stopped, because the moment was fat and waiting. It could go any way. Egg came down out of the sky that was not an egg but a rock. It struck Sarah Mitchell in the face. The blood was red and shocking on her ghost-white skin, and the moment was wide open, time snapping back the other way, everything moving too fast, happening all at the same time instead of taking turns the way events are supposed to. And suddenly David's grip on my arm was a vice, physically lifting me, pulling me back toward the building, trying to keep my feet while someone screamed. Everybody go back inside, David shouted. 
And then another woman screamed, a different kind of noise, like a shout of warning. And I heard it. Shout that was a roar like nothing I'd ever heard before. Then more screams, men's screams. Somebody lunged from the crowd and swung at David. Moved so quickly I was flung away, the blow missing David's head by a foot. No, David yelled at the man. We don't want this. Then the man swung again, and this time David caught the fist in his huge hand. He jerked the man's close, the man close. We're not doing this, he hissed, flung him back into the crowd. David grabbed Tom's arm again, trying to guide him back toward the building. This is stupid. Don't be pulled into it. Thomas growled and let himself be pulled along, and someone spit in his face. I saw it, the dead look in his eyes. We spit on and do nothing. Still, David pulled us toward the safety of the building, brushing aside the curses of men whose necks he could snap with a single flex of his arm. And still, he did nothing. He did nothing all the way up to the end, when a thin, balding, 40-year-old man stepped into his path, raised a gun, fired point black into his chest. The blast was deafening. And that old sadness gone, replaced by white-hot rage and disbelief, blue eyes wide. People tried to scatter, but the crush of bodies prevented it. David hung there in the, in the crush, looking down at his chest. The man fired three more times before David fell. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Accept our brother David into your warm embrace. The priest lowers his hands and closes the Bible. The broad casket is lowered into the ground. It is done. Dr. Michaels carries the boy as my sister helps me back into the limo. The night David was killed, after the hospital and the police questions, I drove to the sitters to pick up my son. I drove there alone. Mary hugged me. We stood crying in the foyer for a long time. What do I tell my two-year-old, I said. How do I explain this? We walked to the front room, and I stood by the doorway. I watched my son like I was seeing him for the first time. He was blocky, like his father, but his bones were longer. He was a gifted child who knew his letters and could already sound out certain words. And that was our secret. He was not yet three and already learning to read. And there were thousands more like him, a new generation, the best of two tribes. Perhaps David's mistake was that he hadn't realized there was a war. In any war, there are only certain people who fight it, and a smaller number who understand truly why it is being fought. This was no different. 50,000 years ago, there were two walks of men in the world. There were the people of the ice, there were the people of the sun. When the climate warmed, the ice sheets retreated. The broad African desert was beaten back by the rains, and the people of the sun expanded north. The world was changing then. The European megafauna were disappearing. The delicate predatory prey equilibrium slipped out of balance, and the world's most deadly climax predator found his livelihood evaporating in warming air. Without the big herds, there was less food. The big predators gave way to sleeker models that needed fewer calories to survive. The people of the sun weren't stronger or smarter or better than the people of the ice. Cain didn't kill his brother Abel. The people of the north didn't die out because they weren't good enough, all that bone and muscle and brain. They died because they were too expensive. But now the problems are different. The world has changed again. Again, there are two kinds of men in the world. In this new age of plenty, it will not be the economy version of man who wins. The limo door slams shut. The vehicle pulls away from the grave. As we near the cemetery gates, the shouting grows louder. The protesters see us coming. Police, the police said that David's murder was a crime of passion. Others said he was a target of opportunity. I don't know which is true. The truth died with the shooter, and Tom crushed his skull with a single right-hand blow. The shouting spikes louder as we pass the cemetery gates. The protesters surge forward, and a snowball smashes into the window. Stop the car, I shout. I fling open the car door. I climb out and walk up to the surprised man. He's standing there, another snowball already packed in his hands. I'm not sure what I'm going to do as I approach him. I've gotten used to the remarks, the small attacks. I've gotten used to ignoring them. I've gotten used to saying nothing. I slap him in the face as hard as I can. He's too shocked to react at first. I slap him again. This time he flinches away from me, wanting no part of this. I walk back to my car as the crowd finds its voice. People start screaming at me. I climb back into the limo and they close around me, hands and faces on the glass. The driver pulls away. My son looks at me, and it's not fear in his eyes like I expect. It's anger, anger at the crowd. 
my huge, brilliant son, these people have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea the storm they're calling down. I see a sign held high as we pass the last of the protesters at the gate. They're shouting again, having found the full flower of their outrage. Sign says only one word, die. Not this time, I think to myself. Your turn.